We're going to go ahead and get started on time. I don't know if this is working or not, but I think you can hear me either way. Um, my name is David Ingram, uh, director of the CPSI Education Court, and sponsor this career development series. We are always looking for topics that are of interest. To, so if you have suggestions, including first, we would welcome them. It's really a pleasure today to have with us uh, John Stom, who's an associate professor of medicine, whom I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with for a number of years. She uh, works in the General Internal Medicine Division, but also based in the Center for Bioethics. And I learned a number of things, thanks to my research details about John in preparation for introducing him. In addition to his interest in bioethics, uh, he serves as the medical school's advisor of the Gold Humanism Honor Society and nationally for uh, the advisory council. He also is the founder of the Phillips Neighborhood Clinic, which is a free clinic staff, volunteers, and students uh, taking care of people without insurance and also educating uh, trainees there. And he serves as an advisor for ICE. Which is a street outreach medical project. So he had any hats, not all of which are apparent for those of us who see him in the setting in the hospital. And he's an expert on sort of healthcare and the homeless, and uh, we're really pleased to welcome here and say thank you for all your CPSI efforts. So, again. Yeah. Uh, and we've got a token for you for afterwards. So, so when you're done, those are yours. Okay. Thanks for those kind um, well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, my topic today is going to be uh, research in vulnerable populations. And it's a Uh, exposed to this uh, was Baltimore uh, because I was at healthcare for the homeless in Baltimore. And people in Baltimore, uh, homeless individuals, were uh, apparently going to Indianapolis where Eli Lilly uh, uh, was situated um, and enrolling in these trials. This was reported in the Washington Journal. And I still struggle with uh, lots of aspects of this um, and can't really get on the side of whether this is. Uh, right, wrong. So this is a phase one testing at the Lilly Laboratory uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, most participants were uh, recruited via direct advertising um, in Indianapolis. But for example, we had homeless in Baltimore who knew about it. Um, a lot of word of mouth. Uh, it was day and residential. Um, so they had beds, they had all their meals, television, games, things like uh, pool and ping pong. Uh, they, and they were compensated about 125 to $250 a day for about six to eight weeks for most of the
explicit are some of the ones that I think raised by this, even though this was a phase one trial. Um, you know, just general research ethics concepts, um, uh, the therapeutic misconception, uh, evaluating risk benefit ratios, um, the population that needs to be studied, the population that suffers from disparities, um, they may not access research, they have poor access to medical care, it's a relation that's hard, hard to recruit. This is bad science. We're using individuals who have a, a great deal of liver disease. They weren't they were drinking. Um, they weren't uh, allowing uh, for washout periods. Um, what about the, these individuals' economic opportunities or economic needs? Um, for many of them, this was a, this was a pretty limited uh, source of income. And then this, there is a need for scientific uh, advancement in knowledge. Someone uh, um, you know, how to balance protecting vulnerable populations for producing interesting groundbreaking research. Um, they brought up several uh, different uh, research studies that have been criticized in the past, but we can't deny the important contributions that these, uh, that these uh, studies have to scientific knowledge. So this balance between protecting uh, uh, individuals, especially ones who might be vulnerable, um, with advancing scientific knowledge and and, uh, band, uh, research. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the federal regulations and the common rule and how they approach vulnerability. And some of the vulnerability that people have been talking about in the past 20 years. Um, go back to homelessness and why this, this population could be potentially vulnerable. And I should actually started my talk saying not vulnerable populations, but potentially vulnerable populations. So right now, most of the time we think about vulnerability as a static category. You think about women, prisoners, kids, and so on and so forth, and say these people are vulnerable. But what we're trying to do, and what we think, what I think is the right thing to do, is to think about um, not as a static category, but conditions that anybody may face that might make them uh, vulnerable in research conditions. Um, some examples of potentially vulnerable populations. I'm going to talk a little bit about compensation because that's a real area where vulnerability sort of uh, uh, played out um, in real world uh, sort of circumstances. And then a couple of proposed approaches to approaching uh, vulnerable populations. So vulnerability is always important to sort of go back and step back to human subjects research and, and just look at the basic principles about it. And researchers need to always grasp onto the fact that research differs from healthcare in morally significant ways. Research is always primarily about gathering knowledge. It might happen in, in, in healthcare settings. Um, it involves healthcare. There's delivery of healthcare. It certainly looks like healthcare. But it's always primarily about gathering knowledge because otherwise, if we knew what the right treatment is, we would be giving the healthcare. But we don't know. We have no hypothesis, and we're trying to uh, test that. So this is not medical care, and we should make sure that we are always aware of that. And one of the reasons why it's important is that studies, or studies many studies have shown that many patients um, uh, have a therapeutic misconception. In other words, they believe that they are uh, getting health care when they're actually in research studies. And they've shown as high as 15% of people who are in research studies do not know that they're in research studies and believe that they're just getting routine health care. Like there's individuals, 5-10% are in research studies, um, wait, wrong, who are not in research studies, um, but believe they are in research studies. So there's a big deal of misconception, there's a big, uh, uh, there's a big disconnect um, among people both in research and not in research about they are in research. You need to look at human participants as really you to a social goal, right? We're using individuals for a social goal. Uh, it's not for that individual's benefit primarily. They make some benefits from it, but it's not primarily for their benefits. It's for this social goal of, again, data that's going to help other people down the line. Uh, there will always be a risk between, uh, there will always be a balance between risk and benefits. And this for research in vulnerable population and non vulnerable population. Every study comes with some risks. And everybody comes with some potential benefits, even if it's just the attention that they, they receive. Researchers, there's an inherent 
conflict of interest between protect that individual and gathering data. And so because of that, we need independent oversight, and that's why we have IRBs and so on and so forth. The National Commission of uh, the Protection of Human Subjects, which was um, came from the National Research Act in 1974, after all the uh, Tuskegee experiments came to uh, came with you know, what we use now, um, three principles that we use in uh, approaching human beings in research studies, and that is respect for persons, treating them as autonomous agents, and that's behind informed consent, beneficence, you know, it's good benefit uh, ratios, and so on and so forth, and justice, there's fair procedure and outcomes in terms of selecting research participants. The requirements for research, uh, any permissible research is that there's potential for so social value, uh, that is valid uh, methodology, in other words, it's science, uh, fair participant selection, so justice, risk benefit ratio of beneficence, and thorough review, informed consent and respect for participants, so autonomy. So these, these are things that we sort of traditionally say are parts of good research. Now, the bell also said that there are some conditions for vulnerability, and this is sort of traditionally what we use in terms of looking at people with vulnerability, and we say lack of capacity to consent for research. They can't, they they don't have the competence or capacity to consent for research. So it's around informed consent. And today, I'm not going to talk so much about informed consent because that is only, I believe, only a slice of what makes people potentially vulnerable in research settings. Um, increase the susceptibility to coercion and exploitation, and then increase risk of harm. So those are the things that the Bell Commission said. These are uh, conditions for vulnerability in research settings. So when you get the DHH at the re uh, regulations, the common rule, which applies to all research uh, done by the federal department, there's 16 federal uh, departments and agencies that follow this, including NIH, Department of Defense, so on and so forth. We look at some parts of the regulations. They involve three specific vulnerable populations, pregnant women and fetuses, prisoners, and kids. And so I'll focus on this. And the reasons we focus on and why these were uh, pointed out was specifically because of their lack of capacity to consent. So, you know, that's why we have kids, coordination, that's why prisoners were sort of uh, carved out and, and excessive harm, and that's why uh, fetuses uh, were um, worked out. Now, certainly, there's a lot of this, right? Um, so, for example, for, for women, you know, there's been studies that have been conducted and provide data for excessive risk, it becomes testable in certain cases. Research or conditions, particularly affecting prisoners of the class, are permittable, and so forth. So even though we look at these populations as, uh, uh, um, as um, vulnerable, we are still um, allowed as, as, as ethically and um, uh, regulatorily uh, permissible to, to, to do research on these uh, populations. But people have been talking about I'm not saying the only conditions that make people vulnerable the only populations that are potentially vulnerable. We have a more robust uh, exploration of what might make individuals vulnerable. So this is one conception. I don't find this quite as helpful, but it's just to show you that there are can be conceptions out there. They kind of overlap, um, but um, this is one conception. And so uh, uh, Marang talks about um, um, uh, uh, different qualities that make someone potentially uh, um, vulnerable. And they can be either occurrence, happening at a time, or dispositional latent. And that sort of sets people up to be um, vulnerable in research settings. So she talks about inherent uh, 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 values such as the social natures of an individual, situational, what is, you know, their social background, their political background, economic environment background of the person and epigenic, what kind of social relations do they have within their social context. And some factors that might make them uh, potentially vulnerable in certain situations. Now, more commonly accepted, and I think, I think one of the reasons this is easily more understood, is the analytic uh, model of vulnerability, which was uh, proposed in 2004 uh, by the National Bioethics uh, Advisory Committee. And they talk about the analytic uh, model of vulnerability. And what they say is that can at points have these kinds of vulnerabilities. And they talked about six different kinds. And other people have articulated even more. Um, and we look at 
whether an individual who, who's considering a clinical trial is under the influence of any of these vulnerabilities. So about financial vulnerability, medical vulnerability, you know, are they sick? Um, social vulnerability, are they from a discounted class, are they from a franchise class, are they from a stigmatized class? Institutional vulnerability, are they within an institution where they, they are dependent? Um, they talk about deferential vulnerability, so um, a student-team relationship, um, a employee-employer relationship. And also talked about cognitive um, uh, very um, uh, vulnerability, specifically about time. So if, if it's during a time of stress, so even though an individual might have an inform, might have the decisional capacity, and we look at, you know, are they able to, uh, you know, are they, you know, able to manipulate information within their value system and so on and so forth. If they have that, if they're in a certain situation, such as being extremely sick, um, being in a disaster situation, and, uh, being in an emergency room or so on and so forth, you know, that infect their cognitive ability to as risk and benefits. Uh, look, look back at homelessness and sort of applying the analytic uh, model of vulnerability, you can see that there's crucial for this population or individuals within that population to be considered vulnerable. Um, one, there's, there's a lot of people who are homeless, but you know, many of them are children, um, many of them Elderly, uh, I have more recent statistics that uh, 33, 31% of individuals um, um, over the age of 50, 31% uh, of home individuals are over the age of 50, so there are a lot of elderly individuals, um, a lot of uh, women who are uh, fleeing domestic violence and so on and so forth. So this, there's uh, aspects about their demographics that make them really vulnerable. Um, they're often sicker than, than most people, so um, you know, we have uh, uh, proportions of hepatitis and HIV, tuberculosis. Um, this shows that um, even compared to a poverty population, they're more likely to have poor health. They've got poor access to health care um, and uh, less health services utilization. In terms of financial vulnerability, uh, you know, their income is low. Social vulnerability, they're certainly a population that's very socially discounted, um, crime. Are increasing and continue to increase within this population, and then also institutional vulnerability. Right, they depend on institutes for shelter, uh, for healthcare, for place during the day, for food, for substance abuse, legal. I mean, so they have a great deal of institutional vulnerability. And a lot of studies conducted in these situations. I do my work within these situations. It's hard to differentiate. We're saying yes. Do they want to be in the study or because they feel institutional vulnerability? Going back to Eli Lilly, it makes me think about, well, even like the person who has had a good reason and to, 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 to participate in that, popular, uh, in that study, um, you know, was was by these kind of vulnerabilities that that individual surely was um, uh, experiencing at that time. Models, um, and these are other, these are other are other populations that have been um, uh, talked about in the literature. So, racial and ethnic minorities, uh, refugees and income, uh, immigrants, um, studies that are done in low income or developing nations, individuals with low literacy. Um, low SES, poor access to healthcare, the LGBT community, students or employees, um, patients with terminal diseases or dying, disaster, trauma research, bereaved participants, so people who've lost individuals. Um, uh, we do a lot of research now, especially in end of life care, um, for survivors, um, stigmatized conditions, HIV, mental illness, substance abuse. So there's been uh, a lot written about these populations as being potentially vulnerable, applying the analytic model uh, to people who are potentially uh, going to be in research studies. So I'm just going to talk a few populations just to show uh, 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 how vulnerability uh, might play out uh, within these populations and, and their desires to be in uh, research. So uh, you get African Americans, um, you know, they're 12 percent of the uh, 12 and 12 percent of the U.S. population and just, you know, can see that they're they're potentially uh, subject to a, a lot of 
uh, conditions that might make them vulnerable within research settings, health literacy, access, utilization, income, um, racial biases, and so on and so forth. But only 4.5% of en enrolled participants in NH studies are African American. So even though we're we may be trying to protect these individuals, they're not participating um, as much as we would like them because certainly it's not extrapolate a lot of the data then is not extrapolate extrapolatable to, to, to that population. Now we've only found that there's greater distrust of investigators, greater belief that harm will occur, belief that no full disclosure. A lot of this is probably the impact of historical precedents like uh Tuskegee, um, the Kennedy Krieger led experiments and so on and so forth. Um, but it really brings to the brings to the fore that this is a potentially vulnerable population uh, is underrepresented in studies, but is that is yet underrepresented in studies. And we need to get that balance, but how do we do so when subject to potentially a lot of vulnerable conditions? Um, one of the reasons is that they're not as, uh, not asked as much as white to participate, and I think that's a, there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think part of that might be because of seeing this population as being uh, uh, potentially vulnerable. Um, now, going back to pregnant women, um, you know, their particular importance to pregnant and pregnant to be women, uh, women um, and still lack a broadly accepted ethical framework to guide uh, clinical research involving uh, pre pregnant women. Most intervention re research with pregnant women know to be high risk, even without balancing risk of not performing research. And pregnancy is dynamic, and we allow most studies to be done in the latter stages of pregnancy, whereas, for example, the Zika effects are surmised to be uh, in early in pregnancy. So I think there's individuals saying, well, maybe, again, using categories of vulnerability is not good enough because we can't just say, well, pregnant women are as a category. Um, and think about more, uh, maybe we should apply an analytic model and say within that context, are they suffering from vulnerability? And I would think that if they wanted to, to learn about the, the effects of Zika, um, you might be a little, little bit more permissible um, in this uh, because uh, of, uh, of the need to get this kind of research, uh, this data. Um, how about uh, healthy volunteers? Just a couple of examples of students who participated in studies. Um, this young woman um, enrolled in trials uh, for spending money. And two days later, she died from complications, anesthesia. Um, another woman uh, who was uh, a nurse at NIH um, was offered 1,300 a sleep study. She didn't reveal a history of bulimia, and she died of a cardiac arrest. And then Tracy Johnson, which had a lot of publicity, she was um, uh, in the symbolic trial at Eli Lilly. Um, she was paid $150 a day, room and board, and she committed suicide um, during a dry out period um, in the Eli Lilly dormitory. And so what people have written is about healthy volunteers. These individuals sub to, and certainly these are people who are educated and certainly not uh, subject to some of the, the vulnerabilities that the, the, that the Belmont Commission pointed out. Are these individuals possibly vulnerable? So um, there's three main ethical concerns. You know, do they have a sufficient understanding of risks and benefits? Um, the financial compensation is Proportionally affect their decisions. And data from uh, healthy volunteers scientifically valid. And as you can see, for example, um, one individual uh, did not reveal, reveal her history of bulimia, possibly so that she can enroll in the study. So there's some data. Um, one study found that 17% uh, of the individuals who are universally educated in the study were to name three risks. Um, study found that one third of the individuals uh, uh, that were uh, healthy individuals didn't know that the drug was in or, uh, was experimental. 63% um, instantly believed that the stipend was proportional to the risks that were uh, undergoing. 80% said compensation was the main risk um, of being in it, and 40% enrolled in it under extreme financial stress. They found that that participants. Uh, healthy volunteers um, often do not observe washout periods like we saw in that homeless study. And um, compared to uh, individuals who are ill uh, with the disease that is being studied, um, they're more likely, uh, healthy volunteers are more likely to provide incorrect information. Presumably, 
so that they can get enrolled in studies. So this is a research. Uh, this is a study that was done um, in the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Bioethics. Um, what found was in the 2000 Southeast tsunami, survivors harassed, biological specimens were small. Um, but the need for timeliness, uh, for example, getting RB approval, getting the data when it was fresh and valid. Um, but there were issues because oftentimes uh, disaster research is done in developing nations. There's an infrastructure breakdown that has occurred. Um, so people are not uh, as, as well, their, their needs are not as uh, well met. Um, the participants um, suffered from a great deal of pain, physical, psychological. They were cut off from social support. Um, they were linked, uh, they were needing food, shelter, and health care. The, the, the aid was linked to, to the rich in many, uh, um, in many situations. So um, if they received aid, they had to enroll in their studies. And um, churches, uh, talked about the tension between providing aid and collecting data. Um, but on and for example, this is a population that might be considered uh, um, um, because of um, um, uh, medical vulnerability, palliative care patients. Um, and this is one study, uh, uh, palliative care patients seem to have a positive uh, experience. They found it uh, in research studies, a therapeutic catharsis, they gain insight insights into the illness, they find it empowering, um, they find therapeutic value in research uh, visits, um, there is uh, knowledge gain, uh, research findings, data of the science, and then altruism. And, and I, I, I realize I don't have much on altruism, but all the studies that I looked at, there is a sizable portion of individuals who enroll in uh, research studies specifically uh, for altruism, and that should not be discounted. Um, uh, why female sex workers in India um, uh, enrolled in studies? So they uh, enrolled because of personal financial difficulties, um, societal pressures. Uh, what they talked about is that they are a very uh, stigmatized uh, uh, part of the community, um, and they felt that they needed to give something back to society, so they enrolled in studies. Um, peer pressure, um, disappointing authority figures. Uh, these were, again, very low on the power differential, and um, they did not want to disappoint people above them. And then also uh, contractual obligations. They felt that once they signed uh, informed consent, that they could not uh, uh, remove themselves uh, from the study. So first three are, are extremely problematic personal difficulty, societal pressures, peer pressure, things that maybe uh, individuals would not, not be subject to and may not uh, enroll in these studies, um, but individuals did um, because they felt these pressures to do so. Um, the uh, prisoners, and again, I, I think it's an important one because uh, prisoners are a protected group uh, within the uh, uh, um, uh, HHS uh, regulations, but like this show that maybe, again, in these static categories might not be the answer to do so. For, for, so, for example, this study of administrators, IRB, uh, prisoners, um, research ethicists and researchers, and five themes came out of this. One is altruism was a major reason for these individuals to uh, participate in this, and so we don't want to limit individuals, especially if they've been incarcerated, they feel like they 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 would like to pay to society. Um, there are opportunities to express their altruism, um, found positive uh, uh, social support and interactions by in, enrolling. Um, they got access to knowledge, and information, and healthcare. But then on the flip side, um, they they were also influenced by compensation and in, incentives, and, and uh, many of them said that they felt coerced to be in it. So uh, I think. It's it's a nuanced thing, uh, uh, this study and other studies of prisoners who have enrolled in studies uh, demonstrates that it's not all good and it's not all bad. And to look at them specifically as categories may not be uh, the best way to, to do so. Talk a little bit about compensation because it is an important uh, concept that comes up um, in this uh, uh, discussion of vulnerability. Can is a threat um, because of undue influence. So for the Belmont uh, uh, Commission, they said it was excessive, unwarranted, 
inappropriate or improper reward or other overture in order to obtain uh, compliance. The OHRP says that payments should not be so high that they cre create an undue influence. And an undue influence is something that compromises the prospective participants' examination and evaluations of the risks. So having money in front of them makes them uh, 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 skew how they, they look at the risk balance ratio, or it affects the voluntariness of, uh, of their choice, uh, and so they can't refuse. Uh, some people say that, that competition is exploitive. Um, there's a power differential already between researchers and participants, and then to add money to this makes it really to a situation that makes it almost, well, they, they call it exploitive. Whereas others, uh, such as Ezekiel Emanuel, so, um, you know, the, it has no effect on informed consent and really making much ado about nothing when we talk about con con um, consent, uh, when we talk about compensation. Um, a couple of other concerns that come up uh, with this is, um, does it lead to participant dishonesty? Um, you know, as, as I mentioned in that other studies, people were less likely to, to be honest um, when or healthy volunteers, whether that was because of money, that, that study really couldn't uh, parse out um, effects on individuals from lower SES. So there's a little bit of data to help, help us think about this, but it's, but it's very little. So w this one study shows uh, that uh, there's a great deal of confusion and uh, there really is no consensus on how to approach compensation. This is 39 IRB chairpersons across the United States. It was a qualitative approach to the study. And what they found is that the undue inducement, if you take out undue, it's inducement. If you get as an offer, and coercion, which is a threat, so it's a, that's a bit of a thing, a negative thing. It depends on the words that you use and how you look at this. Um, or can use interchangeably with other individuals. So they could not conceptualize whether the compensation was a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and there was a great deal of um, tension between uh, paid and volunteer compensation versus altruism. And no clear and consistent approach within the IRPs that these individuals um, chaired. Um, we found that increased payment was associated with increased perception of risk. Um, so when individuals Okay, I'm going to give you $20 for this study, or I'm going to give you $40 for the study, or I'm going to give you $60. As the increasing payments went up, they thought, okay, this must mean that you're going to offer must mean that there's greater risk. Which is a good thing, right? For them, I think, in terms of perceiving how, uh, the risk benefit ratios. But it also correlates with increased desire to participate. In other words, individuals want more money. They thought that it was more risky, but they still wanted to be in it because there was more money. Um, and found that um, uh, income payment had no effect on risk perception. And it's not clear what we want to perceive. I mean, I think that we want them to be more judicious in, in, in evaluating the risk benefit ratios. Um, but we certainly don't want them to get to a point where uh, it, it, it actually affects their real ability to. to, to um, to to to, uh, to evaluate that. Um, this is a study done with participants with uh, schizophrenia. Um, these individuals had median income of thousands of dollars a month, so not wealthy individuals. Um, and these were picked out as people who are interested in research with no trust issues. Um, so uh, they sort of uh, screen for people who might be uh, willing to to enroll in studies. And they uh, said these are the five different studies that we would do from uh, minimal risk to, to higher uh, uh, risk. And they assessed risk will participate in the compensation uh, threshold. So the minimal risk scenario, which was scenario one, um, there's no correlation between uh, perception of risk, willingness to participate, and how much they wanted to be paid for their, for their research. But in the more uh, more invasive ones, there was a strong car correlation between perception of risk and benefit, compensation threshold, and willingness to participate. And so in other words, um, as their perception of risk and benefit went up, their compensation uh, threshold went up as well. So in other words, they wanted more money to participate. But it correlated with a greater willingness to participate. So. Right there, their perception of risk uh, uh, went up. 
Uh, and rightfully so, I think their compensation uh, threshold went up because if you're undergoing more steep risks, you should probably want more compensation. Um, but what's disturbing a little bit is that the willingness to participate for a lot of actually disturbing is that their willingness to participate went, even with increased thresholds of risk benefit ratios. In other words, you could buy people or you could pay them um, to overcome their uh, perceptions of risk and benefit. And then conversely, um, lower. Um, uh, it, it, it worked conversely as well. A study with uh, farm, uh, students, 12 volunteers, they did a three by three uh, grid of level of risk and level of, uh, of, mon of monetary payment. Both risk and monetary payment independently was associated with um, willingness to participate. So when run up, they were less will willing to, uh, to participate, but when monetary payment went up, they were also more, more willing to participate. Um, it was uh, a few months ago in New England Journal of Medicine, and I think it's got some good things to think about when you think about compensation. Um, the authors uh, believe that uh, uh, compensation is ethically permissible, um, but that this might be a good taxonomy to think about when you are compensating individuals, that there are three types that, that they find um, morally permissible. One is reimbursement for out-of-pocket expenses, so parking, um, daycare, so on and so forth, they find that that is uh, uh, permissible. Um, you know, CIOMS says, you know, parts of this should not have to pay for a social good, but they reflect the true, true costs. So um, we shouldn't overcompensate for the costs that they that they do, because that might lead to maybe, again, this idea of undue um, induced um, compensation for times and burdens. And they make some interesting points here about the compensation for uh, times and burdens. It's just compensation for the analogous time consuming and burdensome unskilled work. So, in other words, we're not going to be paying them $3 an hour that, let's say, uh, skilled or $300, what way you get that? <laughs> uh, you know, whatever, $100 an hour um, for skilled uh, uh, work, but uh, should be unskilled work because as research participants, they're getting. Un, they're doing unskilled labor. And again, I want to be so that it causes an undue inducement. And it's tied to earning potential. So you can pay a doctor more for three hours that they spend in, and then a, uh, than so much less than a doctor. It should be for the work that they do. And it's a risk. Should show you, uh, uh, you know, that there is not um, a consensus on this. The OHRP says that it should be tied to risk. So be paying a little bit more um, if it's riskier. CIOMS says no, it shouldn't be tied to risk. It should be just $10 an hour, not tied to earning potential, and not tied to risk. And finally, they say that it is, um, that it is ethically permissible to incentives uh, to participation um, to retain, um, but to really be aware for, for undue inducement and whether uh, your participants or participants um, are under any of those conditions that, that might impart vulnerability to them. Um, they find uh, it socially valuable and reasonable participants to, to be induced, I mean, to, to, to be incentivized. So, so management, should there be a regular response to this. Um, uh, the individual who talks about it as being uh, excited says we really should restrict research on those vulnerabilities that cannot be predicted by existing regulations and norms. So a large a large group of individuals or a large group of individuals in certain studies um, that would be restricted. Whereas uh, an, another individual says, uh, you know, this uh, these kind of regulations would really prevent prevent meaningful research, and what he says is that it should be investigator managed. And I think that's probably what is, what is probably his best one, because are we equipped to do so for the, so for example, the OHRP has oversight over, over, over private studies. 75% of, of human research studies are not done in, in private settings. So they have no way to even monitor these studies. Only 25% are done in academia. And and the app, for example, inspect, uh, inspects only 1%. So we don't have the infrastructure 
or the resources to do this. So um, it needs to be investigator managed. Um, one person who's been about investigator management um, is um, is Marang, and she says, in addition to uh, the principles that we follow in the Belmont, uh, we need to minimize risk specific to uh, uh, trial. But they should also be clear not to generate or exacerbate dependency within your studies or generate or exacerbate vulnerability. And we, and we need to promote autonomy in how we conduct our research with these potentially vulnerable populations. So we model and approaches that I think um, so this is a study that was done in Zimbabwe. You know, they got the stakeholders uh, involved, um, the parents and the, and, the, and, the, and the school children and things like this. And what I think was really interesting is that they, uh, they came up with the agreement that the community should set this compensation level. So in other words, they didn't think that the compensation would be an undue inducement if the community came up with the, uh, the compensation level. So it's fairly simple, idea, but I think that really will go a way to protect these individuals within that study. Um, this is a study that was done with three Northern California trials, two IHS clinics, um, and the University of California at Davis. And what they did to uh, protect the potentially vulnerable uh, population is develop the research ethics training programs that specified to address the specific vulnerabilities of this population. Um, and so they, uh, they got the stakeholders involved, uh, they, they had you know, the researchers, ethicists, and they came together. And they came up with a research training program to, to train all the, the native researchers, as well as the, 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 um, the unit researchers, uh, to specifically, to model the course, specifically for um, American Indians and Alaska Natives living in that community. And so, for example, there was a special emphasis on harms, conflicts of interest, and historical precedents in, 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 in studies that have uh, used these populations. And so, um, uh, a fairly simple idea, but I think probably one that was very valuable in protecting the interests of this potentially vulnerable population. That actually failed. So this was a University of California USF UNSW trial of tenofovir among Cambodian uh, self sex workers. They were looking at prep. Uh, they engaged uh, the community. There was concern about uh, side effects, and the community wanted a guarantee of 30 years protection. Um, and the NIH refused, and the Cambodians withdrew. So this study did not take place. They, 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 they involve the community and they really brought up, you know, what are the possible effects to this particularly vulnerable community. Um, a that might have been harmful to this community didn't happen. Sure, we get the results, but there was no result, resultant harm to this community. Um, here some conceptual approaches. So, um, Leslie London wrote about this in the Journal of Medical Ethics. Uh, one way to approach vulnerable or potentially vulnerable populations is to use the human rights approach. And the, that we ought to preface the interests of vulnerable peoples in ways to change their conditions of vulnerability. So in other words, we need to build into our studies uh, um, that will change their conditions of vulnerability. If they're vulnerable in certain ways, the studies ought to reflect that vulnerability and adjust those vulnerabilities so that when we are finished with that community, that community is less vulnerable in those ways. And the high bar, I mean, she says researchers are self-imposing obligations that states fail. So states are failing, uh, you know, you know we're, we're living, these communities are being failed by the states that, that them these human rights, saying that we as researchers may have to step in and do that. And that this might be the ethical permissible way to deal with uh, vulnerable populations. And researchers become agents of realization of human rights, both material, but uh, other things such as um, uh, in citizenship, uh, uh, improving dignity, improving their agency and autonomy, and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, and she, 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 she was saying that, you know, that 
we have a need to advance population and societal goals, and that rights can be traded off for the, for the common good. It, that, that we can work with these populations as long as we see ourselves as um, of, 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 of human rights within that population. And that, you know, it, this does shut off the possibility of doing research with vulnerable populations. Another promising thing um, uh, in uh, uh, approaching vulnerable populations, you know, is, is CBPR. Um, you know, I mean, really grew out of trying to get more valid data, but I think it's it's an ethical uh, 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 tool as well because you have shared decision making, uh, making co ownership of the uh, uh, of the rich product. So, in other words, uh, you are uh, advancing. You you are, for example, reaching this goal of leaving this. A community less vulnerable than they were um, prior to it. If you have true co-ownership of the research pro pro product, um, learning, and, um, and then you know the fact that it's uh, relevant to the social social context, so taking into account all those possible uh, um, ability. But the concerns are just like individuals, um, communities, you know, authenticity and autonomy of the community participation, the power differentials, as well as unintended and unforeseen consequences. So patients, if when approaching potentially vulnerable populations, and again, I think that all populations are potentially vulnerable is to, is to, is to apply the, the National Bioethics uh, Advisory Committee uh, um, model and say, you know, are there certain conditions at this time that impart vulnerability to them? Um, and to look at informed consent, not just about decisional capacity, not in that narrow terms, as you know, as can they understand the material, can they, so on and so forth, but informed consent, and that informed consent um, changed, or is the risk uh, assessment um, changed? Uh, uh, is their understanding changed um, because of vulnerabilities? Is there more, is, you know, when you look at uh, the other parts of informed consent, Consent, uh, such as voluntariness. Is their voluntariness affected um, because of their of, of their of their uh, of their availability? So not so informed consent. Not as simply, uh, you know, do they have decisional capacity? Do they send an outcome and, do, and so on and so forth? But is informed consent changed by by the fact that they are are, are potentially vulnerable? Um, their access to health care, being the risks and benefits, uh, the thought of. Uh, of, of uh, you know uh, compensation and, and how you address compensation and what that compensation um, is is intended to do and then really in, in engaging the population in it. Um, that's what has been identified as further research is needed in this. You know why do people enroll in research studies? There's a literature in this, but we still have a lot of areas that need to be looked at, especially. People that are potentially uh, vulnerable. Um, the therapeutic misconception. Uh, you know, the, the 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 figures I stated earlier about the therapeutic misconception. Up to 50% of individuals who are not who are who are in research studies thinking that they're not. They've been done in populations that are not potentially vulnerable. They, these were done in radiation experiments, cancer st patients, and so on and so forth. People who who have you know are not from populations that that that, that are more. Uh, um, um, at risk of being vulnerable. Um, the role of compensation, uh, the level of compensation, we still need to look at what's this impact on risk assessment, impact on the willingness to participate, and coming up with um, various strategies and uh, to help manage and mitigate um, vulnerabilities. So a lot of research to be done in this area, um, and I, but I think more, more people are doing this uh, and certainly will help us um, uh, um, uh, uh, conduct research within this population. So um, thank you for your attention, and I'll, I'll take some qu questions now. Great questions that were asked for me. So there are a couple of questions here about uh, assessment of capacity. And so, oh. So go ahead. oh, yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, I was struck by the 12% uh, African American population, 4% participants in uh, clinical trials. And uh, thinking about, and this doesn't apply to phase one and two, but, you know, people who are all in a phase three trial do better than their 
counterparts who get usual care. And so by limiting vulnerable populations from enrolling at least three and four clinical trials, we're prohibiting them from the benefits. Probably a group of people who benefit even more than the general population. So, it, it, you know, if you could comment on where we should be, not in a small clinical trial, but in large clinical trials, what kind of enrolled participants are from a vulnerable population and should we have a target? Elimination of the results to vulnerable populations. Right, right. So I, you know, I think that um, the fact that there's a mismatch is, is both um, investigator of uh, data generated as well as population generated. They're less likely to, to you know, populate less likely to want to enroll and so on and so forth. And what you're asking is saying, should we have should we have affirmative action or that that's the thing to try to to in, over enroll from from this population? Or if it's to make sure that the societal benefit applies to everyone. As it is the vulnerable populations don't get the societal benefit of the trial because the results in populations might not even apply to them. Right. Or they might not have access to medications when, right. when, and so on and so forth. You know, we took these African Americans, brought them into Baltimore to live in these unsafe houses, and so on and so forth. And people look at that and say, "Oh, well, we need to, to to stay away from this community now because you know we don't want to be another Kennedy Krieger." And then that, but really, the fact that they're under enrolling in this and not getting societal benefits, and not getting the personal benefits of being in, in a research study, um, and so on and so forth. So that's the second. Part of the part of it is that, that that I think that we need to be more aware of of vulnerability and how it's it is not a static quality um, and how it's not a fixed quality and that and and that needs to be weighed with the need to get more of these individuals into these studies and then I think you know then then it leads to you know um, to healthcare once once the the, the result is known so I think it happens in all phases and I think it needs to to certainly uh, um, a large part of it would be education to both researchers and research participants. Um, yeah, and if we are better, better able to address questions of vulnerability and, and, and more aware of these potential vulnerabilities, then maybe populations that are vulnerable would be more, more willing to trust us and be enrolled in it. I do think we should be. Um, I think he and and Kennedy Krieger didn't have just a bad effect on. African American populations or other minority populations, but researchers themselves, because no one wants to be the next carrier or something like that, you know. And so I think that I think that um, yeah, education can can help in, in that area as well. It's a really complex question, but thanks for asking. It. Yeah, Tyler. Talk, John. <laughs> Great. Um, I was really interested in your by this concept of sort of a human rights approach to research, but I think, but I think in in um, I'm curious as it relates to compensation. So if you think that say like a, a, a basic income or a living wage is a human issue, you pay more than what, what the going rate would be out in the community. Um, and so that, again, could be coercive, but it, it also, you know, you may, if you believe that wages aren't appropriately high in a certain community, you are making up a deficit. And That's I'm, exactly what, yeah, what she would, I think she would be saying in that situation. So I guess I'm wondering how you balance this, like, human rights approach with potential coercion 
if if there's like some income deficit in a community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I said, you know, preface my talk saying that I think, you know, you know your questions, I mean, they're great questions. I mean, I, I see the validity in that, that approach, you know, that, that we want to, um, you know, and, and it's not an easy approach to take because we, I think we, uh, we're, 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 as researchers, we want to be seen as dispassionate, scientific individuals, and um, so so forth. And the idea of researchers as advocates or as uh, as um, a change um, it's just it's slowly getting gaining acceptance. I think there's still people that say, you know, we should just be bringing the data out there and so on and so forth. So even grasping onto that and saying, I'm going to be an advocate for this community because they are vulnerable is something hard for, for individuals to grasp. That there's a lot of validity in that is that if I'm working with the population that is potentially vulnerable, Vulnerable. We certainly can't leave them more vulnerable, and because they are giving us the time and their bodies and so on and so forth, we should probably uh, leave them less vulnerable. And so it would be, if you use living wage as a, as an example, you would be giving them a living wage as opposed to the you know the dollar an hour that's being paid in that community. Um, coercive. I think to get to be undue compensation. Um, I think so we need more data on that, you know, exactly, you know, we have a little bit of data on, um, you know, how money risk, risk benefit, uh, you know, assessments, a little bit, we have a little bit of data on willingness to participate, but I don't think that the data is robust enough. I think it will help us to know, well, you know, if you, if you give twice as much, you know, they can't think straight. They're just going to jump into it. But if you give a little bit more, then, then they're really able to make a reasonable assessment of risk and benefits. Um, it doesn't really change that much their willingness to participate. I think it will be help, helpful in the area because I don't think it's easy to say when, it, when, once, when, when something becomes um, a livable wage to undo inducement to coordinate, you know, and I think, you know, compensating is in line all along those that 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 um that can human. I think we just need more data on that. Um, but that's that's the thing I, I struggle with is you know you know homeless individuals. If I go in and offer twenty dollars, I'm, I'm going to get a hundred percent recruitment. You know, um, and fair or not, it's it's a really hard question. To, to, to. Solve all the dilemmas in here. One or two more questions. <laughs> That would be a, a, a very reasonable way to deal with their vulnerabilities beyond. And you're talking about beyond um, informed consent, you know. So they, they, you know, they they have that capacity and they're able to to do that. But because they're adolescents and they're such a deferential vulnerability and financial vulnerability, all those types of things, I think that that that, that engaging them in, in that way would certainly help mitigate some of that. Actually, you know, addressing things such as Compensation, you know, and it may, it may think different, different ways of compensating. It may not be money, it might be time, it might be freedom, it might be, you know, whatever. Um, uh, uh, other things, assessment of risks and balance, you know, risks and benefits and so on and so forth. I think that would be a, a, a very good way of, of, of achieving some of these because, you know, subject, for example, to deferential vulnerability, institutional vulnerability, they have more power within the institutions that they're, they're being recruited in. Or or with researchers or their their, their writers or with their therapists and so on and so forth. I think that help uh, ameliorate some of those effects. I think that would be a approach and 
probably something worth studying even, you know, saying to just feel like you have more power within this research. Are you more likely not to engage in this research now that you've had a chance to talk about this and talk about your concerns and, and have a have a, have have um, hand in doing this research and so on and so forth. We can see if that's their perception. So this is a great topic. I know that there's more to come, but I also want to be respectful of people's time. Yeah. And John, are you available if people have questions? Sure, sure. Well, I'll stick around for um, I really want to thank you, John. It's such an important and difficult area. I also want to remind people, please fill out your uh, comments and survey forms. And I apologize for your, but please come and ask John your questions. So thank you again. All right, thank Very you. nice talk.